Hello everyone, today we talk about the medieval county of Flanders for our historical regions series. One of the most powerful political entities, as you know, in the medieval Low Countries, together with other lands that were a bit on a broader frontier, as we will see now, between the Kingdom of France, of which the country of Flanders was almost completely part of historically, there were variations on the boundaries, and the Holy Roman Empire that would incorporate, uh, and we will not discuss this, the same, um, at least most of, of the county at that point, um, after the uh, peace of Madrid uh, and the peace of the two ladies, so we are essentially in the second half of the 20s of the 16th century after the French defeat at the Battle of Pavia, and so um, uh, this uh, this land would take another direction, historically becoming later, by the way, after the Italian Wars, um, also one of the major uh, battlefields uh, in Europe, right up to uh, World War the uh, first, mostly, but also World War the second. In any case, um, what we're looking at notoriously is this essentially part of the North Sea coast, what is now Belgium, roughly. Uh, among its neighbors, uh, Holy Roman Imperial neighbors, we count Brabant, and they know that we will look at in other videos, right? While today we talk about what was exactly a uh, vassal of the Kingdom of France, right? I made multiple videos naturally about various French uh, regions, and this Albite was, uh, say, culturally different like any other to some degree. It still was part, in fact, of that system, right? Uh, the Counts of Flanders were um, among the original 12 peers of France, right? They had, uh, in fact, a huge um, political and, and feudal uh, significance uh, in, in the realm. Uh, it's not the first video I actually made about medieval Flanders. Uh, if you're interested, there is specifically one about the mid-14th century that talks a bit more in depth this relation between the, the French king and the, the Count of Flanders and the communes of Flanders that were um, trying to autonomize themselves and ultimately failing uh, in spite of the clamorous uh, victory at the Battle of the Golden Spurs. We will see it now, but it doesn't require presentations. I made uh, a tactical analysis of the battle. I often discuss it just yesterday even um, about the, the, the in infantry development in the early in early 14th century Europe. It's also one of my favorite uh, topics, as a matter of fact. Um, medieval Flanders is essentially the richest region in Europe after Italy during the Middle Ages. Uh, the, uh, the Really the heart uh, of such prosperity is embodied by the Flemish cities of Ghent, Brugge and Yeper, that is to say Gand, Bruges, and Ypres in, 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 the, in the French uh, version. Uh, and this made definitely the country one, of, again, of, of the most important um, uh, trade hubs of, of medieval history, right? Connecting essentially uh, England with uh, northern France, down the Rhone with Italy, and uh, essentially working, in fact, the English bull. Uh, through their textile industries uh, locally, right, and uh, essentially selling it uh, in the Champagne fairs that were just southwest uh, of that, right. Up to the end of the Middle Ages, specifically 1477, we'll see now why, the core area of Flanders under French suzerainty, in spite of all the, the autonomies that naturally were typical of the Middle Ages, and a bit more of this area, just historically, like the uh, the Low Countries, I made a video about the county of Holland that had a similar history, and you know that fundamentally that in the modern age would take off while essentially Belgium was a bit declining for many reasons. Uh, but um, it was, uh, was still known, in fact, as Royal Flanders, right? Uh, was um, located practically west of the Skelt River. Um, aside from this, the Flemish counts from essentially the, the 11th century onwards, held land also east of the Skeld River, and as such as fief of the Holy Roman 
Empire. And, and this part was known as, uh, in fact, Rick's Van, uh, Flanders or um, Imperial Flanders, to distinguish it, in fact, from, from the other. There are lots of cultural intersections uh, for many reasons we will see now, especially for uh, early medieval history. Um, the bigger deal in the late Middle Ages is the uh, de facto Burgundian conquest of the Netherlands, starting with the, especially the, the defeat, the final defeat of, of the Flemish army at Rosebeck in 1382, and we will explain why that battle is significant, but also how much the, the country had politically declined uh, in relation to this French Burgundian culture that instead is celebrated for, for having mostly defe been defeated by the Flemish at the beginning of the century, but it still essentially made it to, to knock the country out, but also, uh, I mean, in political um, independence, but also during, in fact, the uh, Valois rule, uh, also providing to this otherwise very, in fact, um, Lose or at least you know commonly based right so in a sort of very um, municipal sense um, control uh, run country a sense a broader sense of political administrative uh, cohesion sense of nationhood right this was true in part for for the not just for Flanders but a bit all the the Burgundian Low Countries, and this would had in it would have interesting development later as far as the relation with with the Habsburgs, um, but also with France uh, was concerned, right? So, brief note: uh, why are Flanders called like this? Well, um, this was a name stemming from the area around Bruges specifically. Uh, it's mentioned um, for the first time uh, in the biography of the uh, Frankish Saint Eligius that lived fundamentally from the end of the 6th up to the, the second half of the 7th century. The, the work is, the, in fact, the Vita Sancti Eligius is a typically uh, agiographic uh, source. Right, he was uh, the chief counselor to Dagobert I, the later bishop of noyon tournay So th this were of course, um, the the areas here on the frontier. Uh, the work was written more or less just shortly after the, the death of the saint, right? Surely before the 684. Even though um, we can track it only from the beginning of the 8th century, and simply in the uh, Middle Latin, it uh, makes mention of the term in Flanders, to say in Flanders, right? So the concept of Flanders was already clear uh, at the time. Um, some mm, etymologies have been provided, um, essentially a, a Germanic one that would be connected with the Proto-Germanic flaumats, meaning stream, current, flood, or, or eddy, because um, the mm, proto Germanic um, root would refer to a, a waterlogged land, right? That is what uh, the, in fact, the, the salt mar marshes and mud flats of this low lying coastal region lo looked like at the time, especially before the uh, intensive work carried out by the Counts of Flanders and the, the local nobility um, and communities uh, in the establishment of dikes starting from the mid 11th century I uploaded for example a video about the Battle of Gravelin that stems from Gravelin which means the the, uh, the, uh, the the canal right of of the, of the count right which has to do with this quite intensive um, um, booming of um, especially in the 12th century and literally the, the transformation uh, of the low countries at that time with a relentless work into you know, much from actually a depressed area historically to as we've seen especially in, uh, in medieval times in this southern part uh, one of the richest uh, in the world right um, so there are of course different problems with the aforementioned etymology uh, at the same time because we don't actually have a um, uh, Germanic word uh, form, say, in, in the local, say, the Dutch dialects, for example, uh, there are 
comparisons in Old High German, in even in Old Norse, but the term uh, Flaumdragen, from which this saying the name should have essentially stamped, is, is not witnessed in, in the local vernacular, so that poses a bit of a of an interpretation problem. But it's not this uh, huge deal uh, in the first place. Other brief note can be made for the flag and arms of uh, the county of Flanders that famously display a climbing or rampant black lion on a gold field. And the story goes that this would have been uh, created as a coat of arms from the one of uh, Philip of Alsace, right, Count of Flanders from 1168 to 1191, surely an important ruler under which Flanders prospered. Um, the, the aforementioned period also great transformation of the country. Um, and except um, the the origin being likely not uh, the case, especially considering that the legion says that um, this lion um, would have been brought as a symbol uh, to to Flanders by Philip of Alsace from a uh, banner found by the the ruler uh, at the Crusades, right? Uh, where uh, in 1177 he allegedly conquered uh, this ensign uh, from a Saracen horseman, right? But this, as picturesque as it can be, and sort of capturing a bit the um, uh, the zeitgeist uh, of of this effect of this uh, context, uh, is is false for the simple reason that um, first of all the lion appears in the coat of arms of Brabant, Luxembourg, Holland, Limburg. So there is a uh, specific um, you know um, tradition that even if it existed before, right? First of all the lion appeared on Philip's personal seal since 1163, so before he actually left for the crusade, so we know for sure that this is wrong. But the actual meaning of the lion in this um, European region, let's reflect on it, like in, in the northeast of the whole Roman Empire, being quite autonomous, may have had to do with the sense of independence, of authority, of sort of royal power in this land, separated from the Holy Roman Imperial uh, prerogative uh, symbolized by the by the eagle right so a bit like saying you know the, we are lions in our own land so yes there is an emperor but we are autonomous here and you know that the region was historically uh, we really made lots of videos also in some of these other lands um, in the relation with the uh, German monarchy and it was that detached um, you know banal association doesn't necessarily uh, have to, to be the case because also this is an hypothesis but I don't know the the normal lions, right, in the sense that uh, uh, these vassals of the, of the Western Frankish kingdom were feeling very autonomous since the beginning from the same ruler and later becoming even more powerful than the same king. So that could be uh, the case. In any case, um, the lion is definitely a great symbol of, of Flanders, just historically, nationally. The Flemish are quite proud about that. Uh, the Battle of the Golden Spores is a bit the moment in which the national historiography has associated the uh, the battle cry uh, Flander den Leuve, that is to say Flanders the lion, right? Um, which was also a concept popularized in the 19th century, so in the age of nationalism, uh, etc. In any case, it's fair to say that uh, the arms of the Flemish community um, definitely um, representing the, the, the lion rampant sable armed and uh, Lang guilds do symbolize the Flemish spirit, right? And that uh, was also shared by many other places in Europe, like from as of like the lion was well known in Europe. Still, in Augustan times, there were lions in countries like Spain or Italy. Uh, so, you know, this was uh, also a a symbol going a bit beyond the uh, the local fauna, just for that matter. Consider that. Medieval rulers were quite keen on these things. Uh, every, say, policy had its own animals actually leaving in some cages in the, in the places of power. Lions were quite um, quite common in this regard and embodying a bit that sense of prestige of, of the king of the forest, etc. Now, um, 
speaking really about the beginning, you know essentially what this area is. Um, it was largely a, a Celtic um, a settled uh, region. Think about the Iron Age um, uh, settlement of Kemmelberg uh, in Belgium. Uh, the the conquest, the Roman conquest of the area, right, uh, inhabited by the Belgae. Uh, so this rather Celto-Germanic people, right, living in in the north of Gaul, right, made up by multiple tribes and uh, some actually of the strongest of, if not the strongest of the Celtic world, as a matter of fact. We're talking about the Menapi, the Morini, the Nervi, the Atrebates, whoever has read Caesar naturally knows of the exploit uh, of these peoples and how tough they were um, uh, to be curbed by by the Romans, all right, that in any case um, conquered the region, colonized it, uh, and Romanized it as a consequence in the early centuries uh, AD, right. There was an important Roman uh, route of communication that connected uh, Cologne, Colonia Agrippina, with um, Boulogne-sur-Mer, that uh, naturally had a, a broader importance for the connections with Britain, etc. So, uh, along this route was uh, an important, uh, you know, fortified, fortified perimeter. Uh, and in in the south of this, the Gallo-Roman population was practically able to maintain itself, um, even in some times of trouble in the later empire, whereas the northern part was some sort of uh, no-man's land, uh, uh, a war zone often, um, and uh, and was also less developed simply because it was regularly flooded um, from from the North Sea. We've seen it also in the video about the, the county of, of Holland. Um, and we'll come back uh, on that at some point. I made a video about also the uh, the North Sea, uh, uh, including this regions, but others as well, in um, in late antiquity and in the early Middle Ages. For those who are interested, um, from let's say on the coastal areas um, and the the Skeld River once, the Germans began to uh, push in later Roman times. These were different groups, the Angles, the Saxons, the Utes, um, I'm gradually covering them all a bit uh, in detail. The Romans considered them a bit like all the Saxons, approximating. Uh, so there was um, a coastal defense between uh, Boulogne, Sermer and uh, Odenburg that was known as the Litus Saxonicum, a bit like the one that existed continuing in Britain, effectively across um, the channel that remained functional until the the first decades of the 5th century, right? Um, and consider, of course, that this uh, militarized frontier was often manned, defended from the out, out, uh, outsiders by the same outsiders that were settled by Rome there, right? So uh, Germanic troops, uh, mostly Saxon ones, uh, that thus began to settle from, from that early on. Um, the main group that would really uh, make the difference in the area, and we often don't think about this when we think, I don't know, why the Sun King, you know, wanted to reconquer so much uh, Flanders and became such a... there were many practical reasons, but um, Tournai is where Clovis had been born. I mean, the Franks had really began to uh, expand from that direction, the salient ones, uh, into the Roman Empire, a bit, again, as either as enemies and or allies, depending on the circumstance, really made lots of it is about the Merovingian. Um, and um, there was, of course, a lot of back and forth in the area, right? The Romans uh, managed to crush uh, the Franks at the Battle of Vicus Helena in 448. However, after the death of the uh, general Flavius uh, Atius, and 454, so after um, the death of Attila and, you know, the, really the big change, the settlement, the, the calling of this greater European pie, um, the death of Emperor Valentinianus III, for example, the, also the year after, the Italian Franks um, were essentially to swarm in this territory, or at least they found uh, a, a, mo a modest resistance that they... Uh, easily overrun. Um, so from Duisburg, 
the uh, Frankish leader Claudio conquered Cambrai, Tournai, and reached the Somme River. Right. So, at this point, there was uh, a, f a split of the Frankish, uh, the Salian Frankish uh, people, right into distinct realms. Kilderic, the father of Clovis, is recorded in 463 as the Rex of Tournai, and at that point, actually, uh, a Roman uh, federatus, right, against at that point the Visigoths that were still relatively close, given that just across the Loire, uh, that was still, uh, uh, you know, Visigothic-controlled land that threatened a bit like the civility of all Gaul, but that was the, not the only people, were the Franks, the Alemanni, the Burgundians. Um, Kilderic was entrusted properly with the uh, Roman control of the province of Bel uh, Belgica Secunda, and... Um, it would be his son, Clovis, not just to do all what we know, converting to Catholicism, essentially creating the Merovingian Empire rather than Kingdom, and establishing his dynasty as a sacred one with the victory of the Gauls from Constantinople, etc. That turned into practically the conquest of all north of Gaul uh, in 486, that is to say, after the uh, destruction of Siagra's kingdom and later on the victories um, against the Alamanni. And so the establishment of a truly hegemonic power in um, continental northwestern Europe. Um, the uh, say, Frankish movement brought, uh, together with other groups, to the partial repopulation uh, of the uh, abandoned coast and the Skelt region during the 4th century. Uh, there were Saxons together with the Franks, uh, never forget how actually close, uh, aside from the Carolingian conquest of Saxony, th these two peoples really were, um, historically. The Franks maintained, by the way, their, their original ancestral homeland uh, east of the Rhine. Uh, they still, like, they would keep speaking uh, a Germanic language until, well, in, into the, the 10th century, at court at least given that the center power was to shift in, into a Romance land. Um, so in, in the 5th century you have the Salian Franks specifically settling in what is today's uh, northern France and Wallonia. So the one of the three regions of, of Belgium together with Flanders and, and Brussels, uh, which is um, still today primarily French speaking, right? Uh, so Romance. Um, this new power, as we've seen, gravitated around uh, Courtrai, Tournai, and Bevay, right? Uh, this uh, was, again, a, a Frankish rule uh, over mostly Gallo-Roman people, right? From the 6th century, the Franks began to settle also uh, all around, uh, managing, again, the movement of other Germanic groups from places like today's uh, the Netherlands and, and Germany. At this point, these areas were really, um, uh, as much as Germanized, also mm, very pagan, like Christianization was there, but it was somehow superficial. There wasn't much of, um, I'd say, Northern Gaul had undergone like a process of mm, greater decay, of um, civilization compared to the South. Uh, in any case, uh, there were some, of course, monarchic arrangements as the Merovingians took over from more prosper areas um, to keep on converting the heathen population. There was a, it wasn't very successful at the beginning, but it was also pro forma, meaning that uh, the majority uh, of the people was likely already something like both Christian and pagan, but as far as what the peasantry believed, really nobody was concerned. Important was about the elite, right? Especially the one of, of uh, Roman Gaul that um, were creating this very strong bond with the now um, newly uh, baptized Catholic Merovingians. And I say Merovingians, not Franks, because uh, of course the Franks followed as a people, what their masters did, but still stressing the sense of uh, 
monarchy and dynastic uh, mystique that the Merovingians managed to establish together with what we would become as later both the Carolingian Empire, um, also the, the, its successors, and especially France, that would always be a sort more of, a, of an empire than, than an actual kingdom. Um, so in this process of um, conversion, reconversion, the bishoprics were, the local bishoprics were reinstated, right? Usually following the same borders that they had had in late in, in the late Roman era. The silva carbonaria, so-called, uh, you know, uh, in uh, Western Wallonia, separated the bishopric of uh, Cambrai from the one of Tongeren, while the Skelt River was still the border between the bishoprics of Cambrai and the one of Tournai. While the priests Vedasts uh, and Eleutherius were assigned to reinstate, respectively, the bishoprics of uh, Arras and uh, Cambrai, even though there is a debate regarding Veda, St. Vedast, um, and Eleutherius definitely uh, the one of Tournai, which became its bishop, right? Uh, so these were the, the founding moments of properly the Merovingian realm, also from a spiritual point of view. The latter bishoprics failed, in spite of this, to survive uh, independently. At least in the late 6th century, um, the bishopric of Arras was connected to that of Cambrai. At the beginning of the following one, the same happened uh, between Tournai and Noyon. Uh, to um, stress again how um, relatively depressed this area was historically and how it was difficult to infrastructurally build up uh, uh, a satisfactory uh, ecclesiastical administration. Uh, gradually, however, uh, things would get on, on their way. At the end of the 6th century, the duchy of Dentelin, Dentelinus, one of the uh, disputed uh, regions between Austrasia and Neustria, uh, was uh, established. Right, It would later fall into the uh, latter, actually, but uh, this... Uh, is important as far as Flanders go because it presumably at least included the bishoprics of Boulogne, Terouanne, Arras, Tournai, Cambrai, and Noyon. So uh, a, a space that, um, as we've seen, was on a frontier that, that say, the broader Low Countries would represent, even uh, between the, 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 the Western Eastern Francia. Uh, uh, this area between the North Sea and the Silva Carbonaria. Right, it, that would largely, however, uh, outline what would become the later Flanders. So we can argue that it was the Dutch of Dentelinus that really um, founded a bit the political territorial uh, district of of the country. Right. Uh, interestingly enough, at the time, this duchy had a primarily military purpose. Right. It was supposed to. Um, dissuade the Frisians and and the Saxons to 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 harass the uh, the eastern uh, flank of the uh, of the Frankish realm, right? Naturally, the Franks were already more powerful than these peoples that, however, kept you know raiding into this territory, right? So it, it would become a cornerstone of uh, defense, which already. Uh, you know, predates a bit the, the the most intense strategic meaning that um, these areas would would have right in the course of um, European military history. All right. Uh, in the year six hundred, the Frankish king Clothar II, ruling Neustria between five hundred eighty-four and six hundred twenty-eight or twenty-nine was forced to temporarily lose the Duchy of Austrasia. But after the restoration of the uh, latter's dual monarch in 622-23, the Duchy of Dentalinus was returned 
to to Neustria. Right. And this contention again is quite fascinating. At some point we will study perhaps better the uh the strategic context in the actual in the actual campaigns. Um so if we look at the stabilization of the Merovingian realm and the uh, the general revival, in fact, of a political institutional culture on on this basis um, in the in the countries facing the, the the North Sea from from the continent, as we've seen, some Germanic groups had um, established themselves, uh, such as the Saxons, the Franks what would become the future of Flanders uh, and the Duchy of Brabant, right? You can appreciate this with other groups moving from, uh, again, uh, even relatively far away places. You can see the changing of toponym. For example, the addition of the suffix Ingeheim uh, added to the original city. For example, Petagem comes from Petta Ingeheim, which means, uh, given the... Uh, the Germanic root, right, the Heim, so the the settlement of the the guys, like so, of the the ruler, the leaders that, in fact, lead over, uh, rule this this path in this case, right. Um, this tells you how consistent, after all, the Germanic presence had been, not just as in in the form of of elites, but of actual of actual communities as a whole, right? We are talking mostly of a process that happened during the 6th and the 7th century, after which the situation, again, was practically settled, right? That there you have um, a Merovingian power that, albeit fragmenting itself, has established itself in, with, with elites that managed to stabilize um, the area to deter, right, also from the uh, the, the 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 invasions of other peoples, at least compared to uh, the, the the previous times, right? So that's where you find the essentially specific bilingual character of the Flanders. At that time, the uh, Romanization was uh, coming back in some areas. Uh, in the ninth century, right? It's still uh, essentially advancing today from a demographic point of view, right? Uh, and it uh, came to only at that point mitigate the um, that balance that had been established during the migration era, right? In the eighth century, the, uh, the the Carolingians that have gradually substituted the Merovingians uh, reinforce the uh, the local church, right? Uh, also, with a more more impositive means, there had been further Christianization attempts carried out by the Merovingian king Dagobert I, that was basically um, the only uh, uh, the the last Merovingian ruler to regroup all the various uh, chunks in which the the empire had fragmented under his personal rule so that there is a a, a moment of uh, fair prosperity that allows for further spread of christianity in a in a um, uh, volative like the directed um, fashion from the top right after that mostly missionaries kept following Right, ta a task by the same rulers uh, with founding monasteries and abbeys, right? And uh, we have uh, a gradual uh, reaffirmation of uh, the, of especially of these uh, foundations, right? That are different from the secular administration, um, aimed also at conquering a bit the, the countryside. For example, in 649, Audemar founded uh, as um, as a as a bishop of Tehuan, right? And uh, Aldemar is also the guy after which Saint-Omer is, is called, right? Uh, nearby uh, as a city. Um, a, uh, an abbey, in fact, in the latter place, it was known as Sithiu, right? So the abbey of Saint-Bertin up to that point, while in 680... 
Aubertus founded the Abbey of St. Bas uh, near Arras. This is interesting because you see they, they were taking up the name of previous saints, but in the case of St. Thomas, for example, being called after Audemar himself, uh, the, first, uh, the French version fundamentally. There are other uh, important missionaries, such as uh, Amandus, from which the name also of St. Mann, he was bishop of uh, Tonger and Maastricht, right? one of the great, in fact, Christian missionaries of Flanders. Uh, who um, brought uh, to the Christianization of different communities, but also the foundation of uh, different abbeys, like uh, in turn, like Saint uh, Babel, uh, Saint Peter's, one uh, in in Ghent. There is also a religious, uh, the aforementioned one, uh, that instead took care mostly of the coastal region. Um, and uh, the same answer, right? In the latter's uh, biography that we mentioned before, we find again the, f the first name of Flanders. We are in the mid 7th century. During the 7th century, there was also f uh, further affirmation of smaller districts, the Gawe in Germanic or Pagi in Latin in the Flemish territory right they the Gawa were the slash Pagi were essentially administrative subdivisions of the various civitates so the the cities were also the uh, the bishoprics were located in in the Roman tradition the Gawa would uh, establish themselves especially as the most identifying um community of of the uh, of the countryside, right, of the rural populations. We have the Tornacensis, one from Tournai, dating, we know, from 580. Uh, we know the one of Cambrai, the Cambracensis, in fact, in 663, the uh, uh, Taroanensis, the, the one of Tournai, from 649. Um, so there are various, the, the, the Bra Brachbatensis from the end of, of the 7th century, uh, from the um, eight, we have the Rodanenses one uh, seven hundred and seven Gandao the first quarter of the eight uh, Menpiscus from seven hundred twenty three, and even the one of Bruges that, as we've seen, uh, bore the name of the Pagus Flandrensis. Right, we are around um, seven hundred forty uh, five. Finally, we have the Pagus Austrebatensis from the, uh, the, 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 uh, the ancient Atrebatus, because, of course, you know, these places had maintained the Latin, uh, the older Latin name of, of the lands. The, pa uh, the Pagus Cutracensis also um, dates from Merovingian times. So, again, you have already some, uh, the, the enucleation of what would become the major district of the major cities of Flanders later on, right? The Carolingians speed up this process, right? There wasn't much of a, say, uh, urbanization at this point, um, but uh, this, this, during the, the affirmation of the empire, of course, the Carolingians stabilized further this area, and the first um, big, say, trade going on in the North Sea um, thanks to this uh, more broadly concerted international resources managed by the Franks and passing through these areas would provide significantly uh, the land. Right? Uh, when the last Merovingian, or essentially the fake one that was made up as to essentially stage this fic fiction, in fact, of uh, even the, the Merovingians existing to confer some sort of legitimacy to the rising Carolingians, Kildurk III was finally imprisoned uh, at what became the, later the Abbey of Saint Bertinus in Saint Omer. But it's also a very important one because it produced um, a remarkable cartulary, right, from the High Middle Ages. That's where. Uh, the the fake at least Merovingians long hair that had been a symbol of royal power 
were a prerogative really in, uh, up to very late in time medieval Europe as um, physical beauty actually as as a as a moral value were, were cut off in the process right it was cut off in the process uh, that's how the Carolingians as you know uh, took uh, control um, Charlemagne um, established himself in Aachen that is not that far actually from from the region the core land like a Frankish power was this area in the northeast let's say of France and today's Belgium right really so it was really meaningful for the broader aggrandizement of the region for example Charlemagne would spend a lot of time in these in these areas he inspected in 811 the fleet that he had ordered uh, built in Boulogne and Gand to protect against the Danish raids, interestingly enough. Uh, so what would become Flanders later was already flourishing at this point and enucleating thus as such, by the way, through this accumulation of wealth um, along the um, Skelt River. We find um uh, Ghent, Tournai, Valenciennes, Cambrai, Lambre, Douai. Um, we find uh, this were on the Scarp River specifically, um, with numbers of of ports along the coast that at this point do also trade with with the Vikings. We're talking about Quentovit, uh, Boulogne, um, and uh, the Port Isère at the mouths of the Isar. Um Plus, this very rich app base that, as you know, also after the collapse of the Carolingian Empire, would be a connective uh, fabric of, of Europe, uh, culturally, uh, educationally, politically, but also in terms of, of actual resources uh, management. Because they own a lot of land. The aforementioned app base of Saint Bertin, the one of Saint Bavo, of Saint Amand, Saint Vast. Um, Charlemagne um, was succeeded, as you know, by Louis the Pious, uh, uh, whose sons uh, began to fight against his father and one another. This brought to the Treaty of Verdun, that was the major uh, subdivision of, of the uh, of the empire into different realms. Um, we are in 843. Uh, these treaties would establish what we know as East Francia. Uh, middle Francia or and or Lotharingia and West Francia, right? West Francia in, inherited by Charles the Bald included the original county of Flanders that sp spanned uh, roughly uh, between Oldenburg, Ardenburg, and Toro. However, after Lotharingia somehow died out. And I made, as you know, different videos about the Lutheran campaigns, also from, uh, say, from the 10th century, um, and looking at much also of the 9th as a as a uh, Carolingian legacy in the way of wars lands. Um, the Western and Eastern Franks began uh, be began to content themselves this uh, this area, right. There were different treaties, such as the one of Mersen in 870, but uh, overall uh, that, that broader land was yet to be uh, fully encased, right, um, when within, uh, it would fall mostly under, in fact, the Eastern Frankish power, and so what would become uh, the Holy Roman Empire institutionally. And uh, yet, again, as we've seen, Flanders would roughly remain in um in in the hands of of the western franks right uh, the two areas were separated by the Skeld river right and this boundary would remain essentially as we were saying the one existing at the time of charles v in the 16th century the fact that uh, what would become flanders was however in a bit in between um two chunks of, of a contracted power that left thus this gap in the middle did cause important trouble um, especially during the, the first part of the high middle ages right because uh, autonomy would 
um, an inside favor this area is again to develop uh, particularly from a from a commercial point of view but the initial times the ones of the second invasions were were tough right the Vikings the Magyars um, were hitting um, the region uh, it was uh, essentially uh, impossible to organize a, uh, a centralized defense of regional scale especially um, in uh, in this area right? it was more exposed just to the sea raids uh, and uh, thus also just a place where that had not even been that particularly developed in spite of the uh, initial uh, benefits that it had derived uh, over over the previous centuries right uh, so this would gr gradually uh, confer at the local communities that degree of autonomy that um, w at least politically speaking w was speaking of, of the failure of a public authority uh, in the region so much so that the county of Flanders is born proper uh, at this point at least it originated from this Gau the Flandrensis one um, as we've seen led by the uh, Forestiers dynasty who had uh, been appointed by the same Charlemagne back in the day. These were again as you know, important lineages that uh, originally had been born from a relative comital obscurity, right? Um, um, so yeah, a feudal presence on uh, on the air, together with other you know similar uh, vassals, right? And in this case, in the higher parts of the Flemish Valley. Right, they controlled in part also the, the church. Uh, the area was relatively desolated at the time. These were also not properly counts at the beginning, uh, but margraves, right, which were essentially uh, counts of, of the mark, so essentially frontier but more militarized um, uh, rulers. Uh, the uh, beginner of which uh, from in the line was Baldwin the first right Baldwin iron arm who had been appointed as count in 862 right there are legions regarding this this guy the original connection to the same Carolingians that was something really sought after by the genealogical um, very often also fabrications of um, of the, the various noble houses descending from them that is to say that uh, Baldwin had uh, essentially uh, taken and uh, brought away uh, consensually uh, the daughter of the same Frankish King Charles the Bold we're talking about Judith of Western Francia who had been already married to two Anglo-Saxon kings interestingly enough and she would finally um, refuse her father's command to return to him now that she had found true love in Baldwin uh, and so the, the the legend goes that there was even a papal intervention the Frankish king reconciled with his new son-in-law essentially uh, rewarding him with the title of Margrave that would correspond at that point as um, the dowry of the same Judith right in the form of feudal territories so the the Margraviate here is not really um, uh, an anecdotal title because again, as we've seen, this was essentially a militarized, it was exposed frontier, right? Especially during the age uh, of the second uh, invasions. So much so that apparently uh, Charles the Bald, um, not appreciating very much uh, the Margrave Baldwin, even hoped that he would be killed by the Vikings in the process. You know, the Carolingians threw uh, the Norse at one another, right? And, you know, contributing in that sense to the real disintegration of the empire more than, than that these pirates could really do uh, by themselves, actually. The actual reason of this contrast, naturally, was the initial attempt of the Western Frankish monarchy to control the, um, the seaboard, right, uh, in the north, to favor a more active defense in this frontier area but it was somehow more useful for the local counts to exploit this crisis situation by uh, autonomizing themselves essentially
taking over public prerogatives and being able essentially to found their own personal uh, house, dynastic power, prestige, etc. was not easy at all because naturally, um, even though this would include, uh, say, uh, manipulating the Vikings in, into this scheme, that still the latter were not very predictable in their behavior. There were also other Frankish noblemen there that were essentially trying to do the same. So by different scale, they, they were doing uh, a bit all the, you know, the, the same game, right, depending on who was above and under them. The counts, uh, still Margraves at this point, of Flanders expanded the influence of the original uh, Pagus Flandrensis over uh, those territories essentially south and west of the Skelt River. We can look at uh, essentially the four ants, the, the Zeelandic Flanders, even uh, the Burgraviate of Al, uh, Alst uh, to the east, also the County of Artois to, to the south, actually. Uh, this would remain part of, in fact, the, the county until it was separated as a county uh, in its own regarding 1237, right? Uh, and this is interesting, of course, because there was a cultural uh, continuity. You know, the, the north east of France has uh, is Flemish in part, uh, proper, and it does have to do with the early destructuations of these lands, right? So that while the um, uh, the county of Artois came uh, under the dominion still of the Margraves and the counts of, of Flanders, uh, it would essentially be absorbed for good by the French crown, right, that early on, or at least, you know, at the end of the Middle Ages. Because at some point, like, it's like, I don't know, even other lands in the, in the south of France, right, it's not that it, they weren't part, technically, of the, of the country, just like Flanders, in fact, but they had dramatically autonomized, so the French monarchy had to take them back uh, at some point. Um, definitely the moment of greatest growth of Flanders, just like for essentially most of Europe, was the 12th and the 13th century, right? Uh, the House of Flanders uh, that had founded the Margravate later county would remain in power as late as uh, 1119, which was fairly... Uh, a big deal considering the times and places and all the mess that had been happening before. This happened because of uh, the dynastic extinction when Baldwin the Seventh died. Um, in, in fact, in, in the aforementioned 1119, he didn't have a heir. Uh, so uh, this would become at least a, you know, as a as a part of a, a different dynasty, the so-called uh, House of Denmark. Uh, Charles the Good, right? That um, also had quite a quite a story, right? He he was beatified by Pope Leo the uh, Thirteenth in the nineteenth century, but he had been assassinated. Um, all the the troubles of of this somehow very torn land, right? Because Flanders again would develop, as we will see now in in some a sort of functional feudal capacity in these centuries, but the the growth of the local communes uh, gradually eroding that 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 power, right? especially till the 14th century. Charles is also the uh, ruler who established the county proper, right? So he was not called Margrave of Flanders, but Count, right? This had already been used alongside uh, the Margregal uh, title um, as early as the 10th century, because at that point you don't really have a rigid feudal hierarchy uh, uh, so deeply established for which, you know, once you are either a count or, or a Margrave, you remain that. Very often the title was interchangeable, the kings could somehow change it, uh, or the same rulers, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, the Counts of Flanders um, were, as a matter of fact, in the process, this, the, even the last using the title of Margrave, right, which was not much of a thing in, in the Kingdom of France, right, uh, and that would be resumed, in fact, 
in, in the country only in the 16th century, right? Everybody was a count in that regard and or a duke. Um, so the sense of a militarized frontier, especially from this Western European perspective, wasn't quite of a thing, especially after the, um, the, the period of second invasions, right? There was um, a brief interlude under William Cleta of Normandy, who ruled as Count of Flanders in 1127 to uh, his death the following year. He was, as you know, an unsuccessful uh, claimant of the Duchy of Normandy. I also made uh, a video about mm, some warfare going on uh, in France uh, because of him. He was the son of Robert uh, Courthouse, right, the oldest son of William the uh, Conqueror, right? Uh, the, the French were spo- the French Kish King were sponsoring him against um, their Norman vassals right in England. So that, that's um, that's an interesting thing. That's why he had become, in fact, Count of Flanders, which was a very prestigious thing, by the way. But his adventure, as we've seen, was short-lived. Uh, the Count of Flanders went then to uh, Thierry of Alsace, of the House of of Alsace, uh, and uh, under him who ruled until uh, 1168, an important reign also, it was the crusader and he had quite a knightly curriculum both in uh, Africa and in the Near East. And his successor, Philip of Alsace, uh, brought the county to unprecedented levels of power uh, and importance, right? It was especially a moment of great economical prosperity. Again, it's th- this is the guy that is credited again with having brought the lion because he followed uh, he and his predecessor's footsteps as far as again the the Levant adventure was concerned, and um, and this is a moment of great, in fact, affirmation of Flanders properly as an international trade hub, right? Through these. Uh, mm, towns fundamentally that acquire an ever greater trade prosperity. And the the interesting thing about the Flemish communes is that, differently from the Italian ones, that were pretty much the exception in this case, never evolved re- really into city states. Right? These were essentially a bourgeois community that were responding to a count, to so a feudal authority, that doesn't matter how weakened over time by the growth of this, of also the the local. Uh, militias, etc., w- would always remain the referential point, right, for the Flemish. At some point, yes, they were kicked out, etc., but they wanted their own because they wanted still to remain within this sort of feudal um, legitimacy because the land had traditionally always been ruled like that, just they didn't want these um, these counts to be essentially uh, too oppressive, but also too tied in that sense with the, attempt, the later attempts of the Kingdom of France to reconquer, right, at least to bring once again um, uh, their direct rule uh, on the land. So that's most of the game, to make it very simple, that develops also later the struggle of the Flemish communes against the French and and so on. In the second half of the 12th century, the county of Flanders undergoes, again, this great uh, period of prosperity. Philip of Alsace manages to incorporate the county of Vermandois that uh, also appeared uh, in the Merovingian period uh, and that it was uh, organized around uh, Saint-Quentin on the Aisne and uh, Peron on the Somme. So this was an important acquisition because essentially all the more uh, resources would end up on, in, in the hands of the local uh, Count as a as a French uh, vassal, uh, the territories that Philip of Alsace thus controlled were just reaching 25 kilometers from Paris. Right, it was even a larger uh, territory than the one controlled extensionally uh, and directly by the same Capetian kings in the Ile de France. Um, in a few other um, localities. So this is particularly important because definitely there were these powerful vassals and, and Flanders was a bit, bit like a big player in the, in the scenario. You know that, for example, the same 
conquest of England was not just a Norman thing, but also a Breton and a Flemish one. Uh, needless to say, Flanders were was already pretty active in that contact with England, that is, uh, to remain historically even one of the causes of the Hundred Years' War uh, later on, right? Um, so, a moment of great uh, expansion of uh, further connection with other centers, and one of objective autonomy, because the Capetians are still relatively far from uh, achieving uh, their, uh, say, massive exploit um, uh, that would bring them to, to re take control of almost all the Western Frankish Kingdom, in which, within which, uh, in fact, the county of Flanders uh, was, was included. Right, there were very important uh, ports to witness the aforementioned uh, overseas commerce um, in Flanders: Gavelen, uh, Newport, Dam, Beerfleet, Dunkirk, uh, and Maastricht, um, which dated uh, in their foundation exactly at, at this time, right, as well as Calais, right, that was founded by. Philip uh, of Alsace's brother Matthew, right? Aside from this relentless work of colonization that the feudal elite was leading, also with, uh, say, movements of men, uh, as we've seen, dinging canals, founding uh, new ports, um, you know, giving really a, a tidy face to, to a land that, as we've seen, had been historically rough, right? The aforementioned ports had the infrastructural capacity to reduce the silting of the rivers A, Isar, and Sven, right? That were even threatening other pre-existing uh, and also more important centers like saint omer Ypres, and Bruges, right? Without mentioning that the old rival with the Hollandic power was um, bringing to the establishment of certain proper military centers of some sort, at least that had that further uh, specific functions. We're talking about Birvlit, for example. I made a video about, again, the, the county of Holland showing this ongoing rivalry in, in the northern part uh, of the country and the different stages of development of the same. At this point, Flanders are rocking hard, right? The north uh, is, Holland is still more, uh, g way more gradually uh, expanding, but they're working pretty hard as well. It was really a big struggle to against nature as well, uh, as you know, right? And the Flemish trade really reached far and wide. Uh, we've seen the closest, it was England, but also the Baltic countries, um, other parts of France, uh, overseas, uh, the Rhineland uh, in Italy, um, over land. The wool trade with England, again, was uh, making the Flemish cloth industry booming, right? The, all these various um, towns were specializing in textile working and export, right? For the, again, um, for the uh, export uh, in the broader circuit of the Champagne fairs. Flemish clothes were essentially uh, the, the most refined uh, in, uh, in, in Western Europe. They would be successfully uh, just imitated and surpassed by the Italians in the 14th century. Uh, and so Flanders was um, uh, growing from different points of view, religious, politically, socially, uh, economically, uh, etc. Right. Uh, we see the material wealth of these centers. For example, the bell towers and the cloth holes of the Flemish cities uh, definitely represent the uh, what, what these people were really about. They were about really their their church, their their town, their uh, mercantile uh, activity, right? It was essentially an elite of uh, of merchants that uh, controlled the the drapery industry, uh, and uh, was represented uh, and uh, acquired, in fact, some prerogatives. Also, uh, next to the feudal government, it was to rely on them, right? The comital agents had to negotiate with them. Uh, and that's how these communities acquire also a significant political autonomy uh, in the process. There is grain trade with England uh, and through Holland with Hamburg, importantly enough to sustain uh, the same population growth, because all this wealth, uh, called other wealth, but also 
the same labor force that had to be properly fed, right? This from one side would uh, increase the dependency of, of Flanders from, from other areas. And the Flemish didn't really have a true colonial empire, right? Like in, the, I don't know, the Italian maritime republics or whatever. Uh, considered that uh, it was the answer that really would develop um, the greater control in northern seas. Um, and the Flemish were mostly just communities, again, of of uh, bourgeois more, more than else. They entrusted most military affairs to the, um, of course, to, to the to the count, right, and his vassals, right. This was a bit more of a feudal area than, say, in fact, the some other importantly urbanized um, in Europe. Um, of course, the local militias developed their own capacities and force, and they formed leagues to either assist the count and or even to, to challenge his own uh, influence. There were episodes of, in fact, of bloodshed, also different uh, officials, uh, given the, the local political tensions, uh, etc. Nothing like the full-fledged um, early 14th century rebellion against the King of France that is a bit the peak, as you know, of, the Flemish, of Flemish military history. In any case, uh, Flanders were part of France. saint um was also born like in the, uh, in, from, from the western side, um, became the most important transit port for French wine in the 12th century. Uh, these were uh, definitely also the, 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 the centuries of breakthrough of probably the Flemish merchants abroad. Right, uh, mostly in England, again the Baltic, but also southwest France, because as we've seen, the wine there was in part produced, and uh, you know, um, the 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 Flemish had the capitals to take control of some some activities there. The routes um, f- uh, towards Central and uh, Southern Europe were uh, coupled with uh, the 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 ones with the yearly fairs. Uh, of, of Champagne. So uh, this brought, on the longer run, the Flemish to accumulate a lot of wealth, especially in the cities, right? And this is what made Flanders one of the most urbanized parts of Europe, right? Uh, dynastically, in 1194, we have the House of Hainaut succeeding the one of Alsace to the county of, of, uh, of Flanders with Baldwin the first of Constantinople, so-called because he was the the first emperor of the Latin Empire uh, of Constantinople, and we will talk about this as well. But this this tells you how I don't know even more international the the feudal nobility was compared to the local uh, communes. Right, they the the noblemen lived really on a sort of bigger uh, scale of you know mobility compared to the uh, to the communes in Flanders, um, and and this made them, in a sense, also more, um, you know, more detached in part from from this, uh, from from the land. They were really globe trotters. They received um, eventually, I don't know, feudal holdings by the the Angevins in southern Italy. We're talking about the House of Dampier specifically that had arisen to, in fact, the county of Flanders in 1278. Quite of a year, the, the first guy was Guy of Dampierre. This was the same year of the Battle of Markfeld, in which Ottokar of Bohemia was, uh, was crushed. But uh, the Andromans were prospering in southern Italy, in spite of the loss of this ally. And the Dampierre all had deep connections with Italy as well, right? So much that is believed that also the, the, the Flemish tactics that were enacted not much by the Flemish militias per se, but by the actual counts that were deeply soaked in a feudal knightly military culture, um, and that turned to be infantry ones because that's what mostly uh, the land relied on anyway, due to actually what had been a weakening of the feudalism there, and so a sort of dependence of the Dampier and the other counts on the same communes, may have derived from the... Uh, actually, uh, like for the Swiss, this is an historiographical thing, by, um, from, the, from the armies of the Italian communes that were, were really peaking uh, 
uh, at this point in terms of the art of war in, in, in the medieval millennium. This is also the moment in which the attrition between Flanders and the King of France becomes more uh, more consistent because actually the same Flemish counts want to resist the French uh, interference uh, in their affairs. They didn't want to be simply becoming some, some administrators of some uh, properly French guy as opposed to their Flemish background. Uh, and uh, there, there was, it's a complicated history. We will talk in depth about the Franco-Flemish war at some point. Um, it was fought between 1297 and 1305 with the Dampier actually taking up arms and essentially losing much of their fiefs also in the broader French system that we're talking about before um, to, uh, to defend their prerogatives to run uh, uh, at least the uh, to ride the wave of the um, the communal uh, rebellion that really was the um, the force behind uh, the same. Uh, given that uh, the communes would have been the first ones to lose their own autonomies, liberties, and income, for which the French had fundamentally invaded them. You know, at, at that point. Um, Philip IV had bailed out um, of, of of Aragon, right? Uh, and from the diametrically opposite side of France, there was Flanders, right? And it made sense. Again, this is where also the the, say the hostilities with England are a bit the toughest, and there is uh, also, in fact, uh, an English interference uh, in Flanders um, in, uh, in on multiple occasions because. Uh, these guys w could recognize as count, basically um, whoever would arrive, would, and they they sort of hijacked that sort of appointing prerogative, given that still the feudal authority had to respect their own traditions, right? So the Franco-Flemish War is one of also the most important um, episodes in medieval warfare for the famous battle of uh, Courtrai, um, Courtrai. So the Battle of the Golden Spurs, so-called, because the flower of the French nobility was slaughtered in the thousands by the phalanx of Flemish bourgeois that was uh, besieging at that point the, the castle of Courtrai. Um, and uh, this during the, essentially the French invasion attempt uh, of the country and resisting behind uh, the, the canals and with a reserve uh, all led by again the um, the, Dampier, the the knightly element that really also risked and was killed in, in part in the same battle like at the head of, of the bourgeois to give them spirit to give them the sense of you know redemption for being just in fact commoners so what was considered um, without any doubt, an inferior race by the feudal nobility, and that uh, one instead this clamorous um, a day that was described really by the sources like a, as like a miracle, a world upside down, because essentially from 150 years nobody had ever defeated cavalry uh, in more or less open field. Um, we're not talking about big numbers. The Flemish were just something like eight to. 10,000. There are many books written about this. This was definitely the most glorious um, uh, day in uh, in Flemish military history. It's essentially the most important day also in the sense, in, in perspective of national identity and affirmation. Again, it's plenty of, of cultural references um, in just all Flemish, um, Flemish history uh, to this uh, later on. Um, how did they make it? Well, through sheer determination. When I talk about r uh, moral forces, of course, I don't deny the importance of terrain, of guidance, of the type of arms that were adequate to the situation, but in practice, th these were just bourgeois that had never taken up a weapon in their hands up to the, uh, not the day before quite, but let's say that were definitely, that hadn't any professional character, right? I, I stress particularly uh, this because... Um, uh, Say historiography has treated uh, this this infantry battles as all basically part of the same broader military accomplishment, right? Of an infantry defeating cavalry alone. Um, this is 
not really like uh, I don't know how to say this that there were some way more advanced military systems including the French one uh, to the Flemish right you don't have to get from the Battle of Courtrai about which again I made a mil uh, a tactical analysis lasting I think two hours and a half um, on the channel uh, as thus the Flemish had developed a military system that was uh, superior to the French one or just you know if you win a war or a battle you must be that right in absolute terms this isn't absolutely the case uh, there was the following battle of mont in which technically 1304 in which technically the uh, the Flemish did win again uh, in, in the first phase of the battle, almost killing the same king of France, Philip IV, that escaped only because um, a loyal knight to his kneeled in order to make him jump on horseback while the Flemish was, were essentially cutting his head. These were how the, the knights of the time would, and, and what base they were made of. But since they were just infantrymen, they broke their defensive position that was basically the standard they could afford. They uh, disordered themselves. They didn't have quite another backing. So the French or or organized a counterattack and the battle resulted fundamentally in a draw. Right? So these are the, this is the, all the, the peak of, of Flemish military accomplishment. Um, even if it is very painful to say, but aside from the political events, as we will see now, will bring Flanders fundamentally down throughout the rest of the Middle Ages. Um, it's important to stress that this was carried out by a French Burgundian military culture, right? Uh, and that the Flemish wouldn't achieve a single victory after this until the pretty mediocre result of the Battle of Guinegat uh, against the French, but um, uh, with the Flemish drilled by some Swiss instructors that uh, Maximilian of Habsburg had at, at that point inheriting the the Burgundian uh, Netherlands in fact uh, in that country tried to establish some sort of military reform like the one that he would succeed in doing with the Landsknechts in Germany right and for the rest after again the Battle of the Golden Spurs you do not actually find anything like of uh, of the same like you don't find any victory Aside Bonham Pavel, that is, yes, a Flemish victory, but so so. And not only, but all the battles were fought, were fought by the same type of army that the Flemish had. The only thing really changing from the early 13th century at that point um, is a bit of, of artillery, right, in, which still, however, proved unsuccessful during all these battles, even though it was actually in consistent numbers that also were to replenish, in fact, the. Uh, the Burgundian artillery park it would become the strongest uh, in Europe in the 15th century except the army was Burgundian not quite Flemish aside from this militias of relatively scarce valor uh, at that point compared to the professional system that that feudal culture was instead uh, at the peak of um, and so all the hype right for this sort of Flemish tactics is not really that much it, it's an incredibly simple concept right they used a, a single phalanx with a minimal reserve and so the French actually did cross the canals did break the phalanx but uh, that reserve managed to essentially stamp uh, the, the, the advance and that's why the, they found themselves between the the Flemish and the in the canal they were slaughtering that great number but other than that I, I studied the sources of the battle it's it's not really it was a clamorous result, but this is not at all the beginning of a teleologically presumed, uh, you know, rise of infantry on the longer run that began with this revolutionary attack. There's absolutely nothing revolutionary about this battle, if not the fact that, uh, again, for 150 years, nobody had defeated um, cavalry in open field only with infantry. And that objectively in the first half of the 14th century, there are l tens of, of uh, instances of this kind, not in huge battles, telling the truth, this was one of the largest ones. Um, and again, of which to, to which the Flemish contribute in, the, in this way. Uh, the Battle of the Golden Spurs, morally, symbolically, uh, even emotionally, is definitely the most important of them all, but only for us, because we have decided to develop that sense that the future was infantry in insight, etc. But 
um, the later Flemish history shows a very different thing. Because as I countlessly explained, the rise of infantry at the end of the Middle Ages, namely in the, the second half of the 15th century, is actually uh, completely different in nature from the one of this early 14th century. Here we find literally bourgeois and rustics that pick up their arms. They want to kill the, per the people in front of them, and that's objectively the single most important thing in war besides anything else. Uh, the good and dag, the Jupinda Stav, as it would be more rightly pronounced, which literally only means point a stick, and that is actually represented in different ways, more like uh, candlesticks, actually, rather than the, the type of more popular sort of club with a spike that that is popularized, in fact, in also by the media nowadays. It's not entirely clear I mean, how it was actually uh, not employed, because you understand more or less what it what it served to, it somehow, um, again, the candlestick is to be found also in other places of Europe, but it's, say, the way it's distinctive is just like the concentration in this specific battle that is so catchy just per se, so, but even about that was nothing really impressive about it, uh, the cavalry charge was stopped by pikemen in the front ranks, right, the good and daggers, other trauma, um, say, bl blunt trauma weapons, um, of that kind uh, was just uh, used by the guys in the rear ranks um, and just the fact that the French broke through uh, was not actually a, a much of a you know uh, of a reassuring thing in the first place and so there were similar weapons so if you think about the Swiss Volge you have the Bill other you know sort of the double handed axe in Scotland etc um, but um, the function is always the same, and as I countlessly, uh, countlessly explain, uh, technology alone doesn't have any meaning, right? It's just doctrine that does, and here you have just, again, commoners picking up arms of what they have, not really uh, making uh, deep calculations about what kind of weapons they have to use, rather about the, the solidity of the formation was lined up by the knights, actually, that was um, commanded by them as well, and that had a lot to do with how angry these commoners were towards the French. That still, however, um, uh, the overall loss, right? You know, there was this treaty of athis sur uh between the um, King Philip IV of France and Robert III, Count of Flanders, for which the latter lost Lille, Douai, uh, Orchy to France, right, and had, besides, to pay exorbitant fines to retain their, not even independence technically, but still, the, say, not, avoiding not getting properly conquered by the French kingdom at that point. So this is hardly, a, say, in a retrospective political and social and even military point of view, a much of a deal. Um, the, um, you know, the the golden spores of the killed French knights uh, hang uh, in the hanged in the uh, in in the church of Our Lady of Courtrai is definitely one of the single most um, really mystical moments um, in um, in medieval history. If it hadn't been that there was an upside down one uh, for the times being and for the fact that here the elite had failed in front of these commoners that were not really much better than 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 them, uh, definitely from a qualitative point of view. But also Flanders more or less um, entered from this point of view a sort of spiral of political um, instability, of dependency on, the, on feudal power, and also of economic decline, as a matter of fact, right? Um, surely, uh, when you look at the early 14th century, they didn't know the crisis was coming to that extent. Um, the, the war had been ruinous, but still Flanders, of course, experienced a moment of relative prosperity. It had still a very strong cloth industry, diverse uh, diverse artwork, like Fl Flemish painting, right, especially towards the, uh, the 15th century was, uh, and beyond, is one of the single most beautiful, I don't know, it's one of my favorites, if you ask me, um, especially in the early modern day, but also, the, the, in fact, the 15th century. Um, and, uh, and so there you see really what a civilization this had become. However, again, uh, it's sort of um, it's at a point contracted, right? Uh, as you know, while France had the Jacquerie, the um, the the Flemish 
the town, the, the, say the most urbanized places in Europe had the revolt of the salaried workers of the textile industries. They were, however, put down. Yes, there were some radical instances, parties also present in this very complicated Flemish politics um, of the various, um, say, guilds that run the cities that were always fighting against one another. Lie. As it always happens, the most radical sort of communist um, are the ones that self-sabotage everything and make everything sinking further, and first of all, themselves. Um, so that's largely how this sort of Flemish um, spurt, right, of, you know, uh, independence aspiration was crippled um, for good. First of all, under a feudal, a local feudal power, but eventually also a foreign one. Right? Um, trade in Flanders was so such a big deal that the statues of the Madonna and Child were made in Flanders with ivory, which at the time was only as accessible. Uh, by the Indian Ocean trade network. So this tells you still how um, say well connected uh, and entrepreneuring the uh, the Flemish merchants were. Um, so as I was saying before, this is a, this is not a land that develops a form of city state like some, for example, the seigneuries in northern Italy. That there is a decline of the city there with the Black Death, etc. But basically, you have the bigger one that swallows all the others and forms regional states that are real state. Um, in Flanders, you have nothing of this. You have essentially just the same communes remaining there and doing really not much. They had leagues technically, but they are brought down. Um, the Hundred Years' War caused further damage to uh, Flemish trade as far as you know, the English and, F and French markets were being damaged. Essentially, the Champagne fairs decline, so the Rhone route, um, it's the Genoese that actually arrived to England from the Atlantic to make up for that, because they had suffered of that, um, uh, the disruption of the French route as well. Right, so also as we've seen, the connections with, broader connections with, with uh, France had been damaged just by the the war at the beginning of the century, um, the Chevauchet uh, led by the English in uh, in France, destroyed some of, even of the areas with which the Flemish had been uh, connected uh, by sea. So there is a broader phase of uh, contraction, right, uh, that uh, really hits hard Flemish economy. For example, the English become a bit more autarkic at the time. They increase their own clothes production, right, locally, nationally. Um, as we've seen, even the, the, the Italian markets really, uh, the Italian producers managed to copy even Flemish um, clothes. There are lots of Flemish that actually go living in Italy, um, in the center, in the north, to work at these, uh, because the, those were more competitive areas in the first place. Um, the same happens in the same England. Flemish weavers uh, went over to Worstead and North Walsham in, in Norfolk, right? Uh, albeit this had been going on for a while, right? Uh, this wool local wool industry uh, was run in part by the Flemish already in the in the 12th century, because of course Flan Flanders and, and England are that close, and just again they would always remain not just because the countries didn't move uh, geographically, but because uh, again there were multiple reasons for signing. Uh, with one another in that context, even when the Burgundians take over Flanders, of course, they were allied with English, generally speaking, in their struggle against um, the, the the kings uh, of France proper. Uh, so this is quite a troubled phase. There is, again, the Battle of Rosebeck that brings a bit to, to an end of properly of, of even the Flemish feudal uh, autonomy. Uh, the Burgundian state... Uh, benefits dramatically from swallowing this, this entire chunk again of de facto exhausted um, uh, lowlands that do not oppose, re they do oppose resistance but are crushed fundamentally in this again series of clamorous uh, in unappealable defeats uh, exactly for having remained armies of infantrymen while still uh, the, the Burgundians had feudal armies of knights so 
um, up yours all those who actually believe that there was a uh, linear increase in the importance of the infantry uh, from the victories of the of the early 14th century. This is absolutely BS, right? It, but to to a macroscopic degree. But for some reason, um, it, it's again a sort of uh, autoimmune disease i don't know why they, why do you have to believe that what, what is that is that you identify with the people with the infantry with the commoner is it it or is it because you're obsessed with technology with positivism with determinism uh these are severe problems in in somebody's culture right and especially when you realize that military history is not studied properly and that it's so microscopically evident what what really happened right if you actually even just open up a manual about Flemish history, politically, socially, and militarily, that it's all extremely clear. The system collapsed, right? Um, the uh, true end of the independence of Flanders is sanctioned by the um, the marriage, well, at least from a from a few, from a dynastic point of view, the marriage with Margaret of Dampierre. So the uh, actually ruling Countess of Flanders, uh, as well as of uh, Artois, and she was also the Countess of Auvergne in Boulogne. She was the last Countess of Flanders of the House of, of the Dampierre. In, uh, again, married in 1369, Philip the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy. So Eureuxoris Count of Flanders, Artois and Burgundy. Uh, th this is important because still Margaret would maintain. She, she was a very interesting character, telling the truth. She was maintained uh, this uh, like other important heiresses like Anne of Bretagne later on. So they were still rulers of their own land. And so uh, these guys, by marrying them, they had at least as that generation was concerned, the title not to rule unless the the wife of course died before. Um, uh, and or she had uh, that could happen could she could simply say that by because they would negotiate this right that i don't know their their child would have had to be the only one right not the, the husband at uh, that moment the the rule of the, the future heir well this is just like a, a digression uh, in any case this is how on the long run and also not just through marriage but through again um, actual hardcore military uh, imposition Flanders became the possession of the house of Valois Burgundy right these are the same Capetians uh, when you hear the Valois Valois Angoulême B um, Bourbon etc um, these are still all Capetians right technically right they just bore the name of the, of, of the land where they, they had been vassals but the family was were all the same Capetians from since the beginning and um, in this case even properly of the same Valois branch that ruled uh, in France uh, at the time Flanders became thus part of the broader Burgundian state. Never made a video about the Burgundian state as a whole, made a video about the Dutch of Burgundy, how they, the dukes managed to inherit, in fact, also these lands, but aside from some video comparison about with, with the Swiss Confederacy and some videos about the Burgundian army, we still have to talk about this for the regional series about the Burgundian state as such. Naturally, there were some episodes of rebellion against the Valois uh, in Flanders, such as the Revolt of Ghent, uh, lasting from 1449 to 1453, uh, the latter quite of a year, as you know. Also, this rebellion, however, was suppressed by the Burgundians of Philip the Good. In 1453, in fact, um, Philip crushed uh, the rebels at the Battle of Gavere, which was the end of the revolt. Uh, so you understand there is no appeal here, not even after a substantial amount of uh, generations under the Valois rule. Naturally, the Flemish did enjoy some autonomy. The, uh, the Dutch of Burgundy was really centered in France, right? Aside from the fact that they were very... Um, very independent minded that they had all a specific right for which they could not be theoretically annexated to the to the French crown. Well that would happen but only after the collapse of the Burgundian state for other reasons. Uh the lowlands were already or uh, that autonomous on their own. 
the Burgundians could intervene evidently uh, with their armies uh, in the north, also because really there wasn't much of a middle power in between. You know, that the, the, the Burgundian state uh, controlled territories mostly in France, but um, also in the Holy Roman Empire, right? And in between, again, between the Dutch of Burgundy and, uh, and the Count of Flanders, there were just some sort of um, very disintegrated, actually, mostly feudal realities, right? What essentially had been Lotharingia had not um, uh, give birth to any sort of kind of concentrated power in the area again the, the reason why the, the Flemish communes had prospered so much was, was in part this right statehood was not quite of a thing this area was much more similar to Germany than than to France that uh, was much more you know um, centrally organized in spite of feudalism that at some point can become also that glue to actually make things stick consistently together but also compacting right as a, a, a single um, thieves right and that's what had happened and a bit of this as we were saying before happens in the same Flanders because the uh, the Dukes of Burgundy in order to simply to simplify government they start trading all this in fact plethora of very different or at least very fragmented um, uh, stateless yes there were communes as there were feudal monarchies but let's say as, as we've seen uh, Flanders represented sort of the, the most compact homogeneous sort of reality from a cultural um, point of view already so um, and I, I say the Burgundians would negotiate with this as a sort of wall gradually and this conferred um, the uh, the lowlands a bit of that sort of further uh, national identity that was gradually developing right from the uh, feudal universal times right after the essentially the collapse of the great medieval civilization in the mid 14th century which uh, the same Flanders had uh, been paying uh, so much even losing their own independence it, it was again a, still a typically traditional reality that the Dukes of Burgundy were controlling these areas in a in, in sort of the centralized fashion or at least in ways that were not you know trying to alter the I don't know the ethnic the, this is not what the, the medievals did at that point right because there were two complex systems the same communes of course were better uh, represented under the dukes because essentially within the same cities the elite was now as a patriciate also uh, become much more powerful than the rest of the people and so uh, this happened through a fair share of cooptation with the feudal elite that thus identified as few magnates and would rule great chunks of, of the land just without much of a problem and they would give money because again they still had substantial um, you know uh, economical activities also banking as you know was spreading in Europe in a more consistent and sort of stable way with lots more safeguards and structure uh, artillery, right? The Flanders remained great manufacturing centers. Think about the guns, uh, I don't know, sold to countries like England that were somehow technologically backwards in comparison. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Again, the, the same Flemish art and style and, you know, also prestige in, in, the, in the tradition of these communes had uh, remained for sure. Um, some people say again that especially the greatest centers of Flanders such as Gand and Bruges had operated as sort of city-states they had been the, the bosses of the era no, uh, no doubt but they didn't have really a centralized sort of um, uh, commune right they were mostly guilds that operated mostly uh, with gener general assemblies but that did not take the next step of being essentially something um, more than that they didn't have much control of say the land affairs for example as they would have even liked to right and generally speaking they they were mostly just bullying each other as communes into obedience uh, without thinking of annexation or whatever right so you don't have a state in the form of a 
of a city that controls actually a, a province or a region, right? You have just these communes that live within the previous order, right? With other communities, uh, feudal rule, uh, and so on. Um, upon the death of Duke Charles the Bold, as you know, um, in, the, in the wars against the Swiss Confederates, the Flemish, however, saw, again, the, an opportunity to reassert their position as, uh, say, more autonomous powers at least. And this was issued with the great privilege signed by Mary of Burgundy, the daughter of the deceased uh, Duke, on February the, uh, the 11th, 1477. All right. um, this was actually a reconfirmation of a number of pre-existing privileges, right? that uh, had to do with communal rights, not just in Flanders, but also in Brabant, in Eno, in Holland, right? They were all controlled by the Burgundians at some point. Um, but this is done in a more sort of um, definitive way also to cope for the crisis, because again, essentially the Burgundian state had been destroyed in battle, uh, and now uh, there was a, as you know, uh, as we've seen with the Habsburgs recently, that, that hurried marriage between Mary and um, and Maximilian the first that brought in fact the um, the the Habsburgs into uh, these lands from their essentially southeastern German abode so very different lands as well but dynastic right was important and again the Flemish hoped that this would still help them especially against France that after the destruction of Burgundy was to uh, would actually invade the same duchy of Burgundy also tried uh, to seize control of, of uh, the lowlands historically in the process, but um, opted just for the results of Mill's reaction against the duchy proper. It was in fact re-annexated to, to was annexated actually for the first time to France in in as much as what the, the ducal uh, honor and patrimony was was concerned. Mary died in 1482. So up to that point, she had been actually the the ruler of what was left, at least, of the former Burgundian state. Mm -hmm. So that, of course, when we talk about the Burgundian legacy of the Habsburgs, that's fundamentally the uh, the Netherlands, right? At that point, um, it's her young son Philip the First of Castile that has become king of Castile because he married. Um, the heiress uh, of the um, of the Catholic kings um, that had uni uh, unified uh, at least dynastically uh, Spain, while the actual regent, uh, given that he was still a uh, you know too young, was um, Maximilian, the same husband. Um, so. This is interesting because even though, again, France was sort of a dangerous uh, opponent there, still mm, there was not that immediacy or teleology for which uh, Flanders had at that point to complain more about France than the new rulers, right? So that there were some Flemish revolts against Maximilian uh, in the period 1482-1492, right? Um, and uh, in, however, in this case, both revolts were also ultimately unsuccessful, right? So this shows definitely that the land didn't have much, or never had had actually much of a sort of backbone as far as a statal organization or sort of capacity of resisting. Um, and this, of course, was because the, the same feudal rule had somehow been uh, stronger than the communes, but had not been strong enough to be a state them itself, historically, nationally. So um, that tells you the degree of the um, un institutional undevelopment of at least uh, a more uh, an effectively functionally compact reality, right? Maximilian surely was very powerful at this point, so. Uh, of course, the Flemish revolted because they, they did think they could oppose him and they had some strength, but at the end of the day, uh, this was also a matter of negotiations more than actual uh, hopes of, of independence whatsoever. 
uh, in any case, um, the again Holy Roman Imperial forces uh, reestablishes uh, control. In 1493, you have the Treaty of Saint Li, which um, uh, concerned in fact the, the, the succession and uh, brought to the uh, but the international recognition of the fait accompli as the Flanders becoming de facto, even though not the Jure yet, which would happen technically in the 16th century, a territory of the Holy Roman Empire. Right, and this um, again shows you that how even such a far away land from from Austria and the land of the Habsburgs in the, in the first place, and so close to France instead, could still be you know, controlled from so far away, and that, that gives you the dimension of the potential of this land, uh, so not a particularly big one in terms of, again, uh, power, local concentration of their own. Um, it, it may be a depressing story, but if you actually look at all this series about the uh, fact historical uh, regions of Europe during the Middle Ages, you, you see that they follow oh, basically the same pattern. There is a great boom in the 12th to 13th century, then in the 14th century you have a crisis and then they basically either lose power to somebody else, etc. And especially the areas that didn't have much of a previous um, uh, uh, essentially statal cohesion, right, would uh, sink the fastest. Right? You can have a, a strong public authority and civic culture that could also make up for the lack of, you know, being a major land mass or whatever. Um, so there are actually states that did prosper in Europe like that, but definitely Flanders were not technically one of them, right? The centralized from major powers that were engulfed in their own problems, the, the hyper-fragmented Germany, the uh, Hundred Years' War engulfed France, the general lack of other, you know, uh, dangerous neighbors that could simply re annexated for good, like also the Burgundian state, yes, d d basically conquers them, but still rules them with a, st still that degree of autonomy, because they weren't just literally next door neighbors, right? Um, so, everything is very complex, we will see this better when really making a video about the Burgundian state as such. Um, a lot could really be said about medieval Flanders because they are a very fascinating land and today we don't have the time to cover everything, obviously. Um, so we've already seen something a bit more in depth. But all the, for example, the, 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 the feudal power of, of the 11th or the 12th century is considerable, right? Before the crisis of the 13th, where things start to loosen up, where the Flemish start making these experiments with their infantries, with relatively smaller numbers, they serve abroad. We've seen in the Battle of Bouvin, I mean abroad, they were still there basically. Um, the How proud or courageous they were. They they basically fought to the death while surrounded by the French, right? As the, the Anglo-Germans had already fled the field. Uh, you have these commoners that, in spite of all, stood their ground and got themselves killed in the process, taking together with them other enemies. So you really have another view, a uh, view of um, sort of significant um, secular advancement, right? Even of modernity, if you want, right? It's not perhaps very helpful to, again, reason like in these terms, but it, it helps at least to make you understand what I'm saying here. It's, um, it's important. Uh, it's, however, also, again, a, a culture that, as we were saying before, that never manages to get rid of feudal um, intersections, right? You don't have a fully free country rules by itself without feudal interference. It, they are still technically part of the Kingdom of France, and they, uh, as communes, even resort to the to the count, right? That becomes also the Burgundian one later on. So. Um, it, it's this world we're looking at. We're not looking at something more... Uh, it's not even such a huge country, telling the truth. So that also explains it. Um, but it's surely a peculiar one. It's surely one that, especially in terms of uh, urbanization, trade, uh, 
uh, Welt um, is is really impressive, right? And has all the numbers for, in fact, being the uh, one of the most important regions in Europe at the time. And again, there is so much to say I can't do today, um, but uh, we will see it hopefully some other time. For today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.